our speaker today is also a member. So we're very, very fortunate in both Collins again. And Hugh Gosling, who's a retired superintendent of police, he helped to keep law and order in Cardiff. And he, in his retirement, spends time out in Rwanda training police officers. And we are so grateful for him offering to give us a talk on that very, very interesting country. Now, please give a warm welcome to Hugh Gosling. Good afternoon. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Good afternoon. Um, the, uh, there's a copy of the Third Age Matters on the back with the coffee, uh, for those of you that didn't pick it up. Um, the, um, the saft oh, this afternoon I've been asked to talk a little bit about Rwanda. I'm not um, any, by any means an expert in relation to Rwanda. Um, what I have done is been there um, for the last three years, three months at a time. So I've been there for about nine months. Um, so certainly have seen a lot more of it than most people um, who go to Rwanda uh, on holidays, who tend to just turn up, uh, fly into Kigali, uh, go up to see the guerrillas, go to see the memorial centre, and then get out of there. Um, so people's image um, of the country tends to be uh, what they've seen in that tiny snapshot, um, as well as what they've heard um, historically about Rwanda, about what took place some 21 years ago. Uh, but um, anyway, um, I put that picture up on the screen to uh, just whet your appetites. Um, Africa gets right into your soul, and it certainly does. Um, everybody that I speak to who've been to Africa um, tend to want to go back. Um, you see this particular picture, it's a haunting photograph. Um, but what's, what, um, what it looks at like to me, it's got heavenly prizes um, on this young lad's shirt. Um, and um, plenty of greenery in the background. So although there's lots of poverty there, um, and indeed people survive on about a pound a day, um, there's plenty of greenery. So there's plenty of, um, of food being grown um, in Rwanda. So people, uh, there's, not that much, there's not much starvation, uh, but very, very much um, on the poverty line, uh, sort of a pound a day. Um, but anyway, um, back in uh, 20th, oh, 20th of November 2000. Um, and no, gosh, when was it? It was um, back in March 2008, in fact. Um, I was working as a police superintendent at the uh, National Police College at Browns Hill uh, when I was asked uh, to uh, put a course together uh, for senior police officers in Rwanda. Um, so I was asked to put a course together and go out and deliver it. Um, the senior police officers uh, that we were looking at uh, came from about 10 different uh, countries um, it, within uh, the African uh, uh, Eastern, Eastern area. Um, so it was a great opportunity um, to be able to uh, go over and actually speak to these senior police officers and hopefully make a difference. Um, they got together and they absolutely loved it. Uh, they were used to being sat somewhat as you are today. Um, in rows, being taught. Um, so when we turned up, um, and we asked them to sort of shift, we shifted their seats into a half circle, into a, um, a horseshoe shape, um, and started asking them to contribute with their own thoughts. Um, it was quite an unusual experience for them. Um, despite being very senior leaders themselves, this was a completely new concept um, for them to actually um, start mentioning their thoughts and making some decisions themselves. Um, up until then, they'd always been asked to, or told, to do exactly as they were told. Um, not to answer back, refer, refer all decisions upwards. So you can imagine the Inspector General of Police, uh, the boss, had three mobile phones and was constantly uh, making decisions of the smallest nature. Um, for absolutely everything that, uh, that happened in his force. So he was a, a very busy, very important person who wasn't prepared to let anything go. Uh, now you can imagine these officers are um, now the ones that I go to see are very senior officers, around about 21 years service in the police. 21 years ago is when the genocide took place. So it doesn't take much um, maths to realise that uh, the people that are in our class 
are the people who um, were actually there 21 years ago um, up to um, you know, up to their um, knees in blood and um, and you know, horrible stuff going on. But um, anyway, um, what I what I intend to do in the next sort of 45 minutes um, is to just talk about some of the things that I've seen there. Um, I have a bit of a chat in relation to uh, the uh, the course uh, that we do. Uh, a little bit about the people uh, that I've seen and met there. Um, and a couple of the organisations uh, that I've also come across um, in Rwanda that are uh, replicated around various other places throughout the world. So, um, that was back in 2008. Um, first course, uh, we, you know, say we sat them in a half circle, nowhere to hide, um, split them into syndicates uh, to do their own thinking and make their own decisions. So we actually got them practising um, during the course, what it was that we expected them to do uh, when they went back to work. You can imagine when I turned up to the first day, the only white man in the room. Um, and uh, my first comment is normally, I'm here from England um, to tell you how to do your policing. Um, that's what I normally open up with and then say, not. Because um, that's exactly what they're expecting when they see me there. Um, and it's exactly what they don't want. Um, so uh, we're there to uh, just to facilitate uh, their learning, get them to think about things and sort out their own problems. Uh, but um, as we go along as well, I know um, I'm a warmer warm act for an AGM today. Um, so um, please, if you have any questions as we go through, um, then please, uh, you know, please stick your hand up or... Um, jump up and down or something and, and ask and I'm quite happy to either answer or facilitate a response from somebody else in the room. Um, but um, um, we'll, we'll finish uh, pretty much at, um, you know, at quarter past, uh, which is when the AGM is due to start. Um, so, um, this is uh, my first experience of seeing the women working um, on the land in the grounds of the police headquarters. Um, I realised later that uh, because you know, this is very much of the effect of the genocide, uh, there were lots of widows, uh, subject of rape during the genocide, uh, who have to keep children of these rapes and themselves by hard work. Uh, there's no welfare system. If they don't work, they don't eat. And so consequently, you see uh, the women working, doing hard labour um, virtually all over the place, um, on the roads um, and uh, in the fields. Um, history of Rwanda. Um, again, I'm not going to say much, much about the history of Rwanda, but um, Rwanda, the land of a thousand hills, um, was at one time a fairly peaceful land. Um, it's now known to most people as a place uh, where that horrific genocide took place. Um, just over 20 years ago, back in 1994, uh, one million people killed in 100 days, uh, macheted to death mainly, um, and neighbours killing neighbours, um, even children killing children. So, um, you know, horrendous, horrific. Um, and um, the history of that um, originally, um, back only prior to the war, prior to the, um, the sort of early 20th century, um, they, they had, a, it was a kingdom um, with a, um, a, you know, a king amongst them, uh, ruling, the, you know, ruling the country, made up of Tutsis, Hutus and Twa. Uh, not, they weren't tribes. Uh, they, were, they were designated as um, Tutsis, Hutus and Twa at the time. Um, the uh, Tutsis were people who had more than ten cows. So the Tutsis owned more than ten cows. The Hutus were the people who owned land um, and tended to be farmers. Um, and the Twa were uh, people who didn't own either, but um, did the work, or did some work. Um, it was possible to move from one to another. So if you worked hard um, as a Twa, um, you could eventually get a bit of land yourself and become a farmer, or a Hutu. Um, if, you, um, if you were able to buy more than ten cattle, you became a Tutsi. Um, and then the Germans came along. Uh, the Germans... Um, Took, um, they, they changed the kingdom to a more of a government system. Uh, the war came along, the Germans lost, and the Belgians came in. Um, when the Belgians came in, they decided to split people um, into, into Tutsis, Hutus, and Twa. Um, and they gave them identification cards. 
they split them and gave them a split, a different identification that wasn't there before. Um, and they gave the Tutsis, who were the people who tended to have the money, more of the powerful jobs. The Hutus didn't like that a lot. So consequently, there was resentment built up between the Hutus and the Tutsis. Um, and they got to the stage, very much like in um, Hitler's time, where the um, Hutus started to badmouth the Tutsis. Um, they started to fear that they would take over. Um, and gradually, they, uh, they built up the hatred um, until eventually we got to the, um, to the genocide. Um, but um, these are the sort of houses that uh, they're living in at the moment. Um, mud brick houses. Uh, tiny little things. Um, obviously don't need too much heating there. Uh, temperatures round about uh, 21 plus uh, throughout the year. So uh, again, no central heating necessary. Um, the cooking tends to get done in a fire, um, either just outside or sometimes inside the house. Um, so mud bricks and um, uh, a mud plaster over the top of it. Uh, the um, main form of uh, transport is walking, and they walk for miles and miles and miles. Uh, here you've got a lady with her child on her back, uh, tending to the other child, and um, stood in front of her. Um, these little ones here, um, no shoes, no water, no food. Um, and again, one of the things that were quite prized were uh, empty water bottles. Um, I once saw our officers throwing water bottles out of the bus um, and was pretty horrified by it. Um, but then I actually realised that what they were doing was checking them out so that the children um, in those country areas were picking up the bottles. If they had a bottle, they could take water to school with them. So. Um, a water bottle was um, quite a handy thing to have. Um, it's an offence in um, Rwanda not to have shoes, but um, obviously these children don't know that. Um, but uh, lovely, uh, lovely, lovely people, um, smiling um, you know, all the time, um, but um, really, really hard. Um, again, Africa it never ceases to amaze me with people carrying things on their heads. Um, the best I saw in um, Kigali was somebody carrying a freezer. Um, <laughs> just a chest freezer on his head, which is um, quite strange. But um, uh, all sorts of things um, they actually uh, carry around with them. Um, we went to the border at um, Congo, the Congo border. Um, and when you get to the Congo border, um, this is the foot crossing. Um, you realise how uh, ordered and organised it is in Rwanda now. Um, as opposed to completely chaotic and disorganised in, um, in the Congo. There you'll see um, this, lady, uh, this lady here has two uh, big bags of potatoes. And these are bigger than 100 weight bags of potatoes. Um, sort of one on her back and there's a strap they put around their, their forehead and then the other one gets piled on top of that one. Um, and they walk across the border um, towards, uh, to the Congo uh, and you can see just about in the distance the chaos um, around this sort of area. Uh, it's a road up to the border, there's a track on the other side. Um, but um, they get to go over there, sell a couple of bags, come back with the money, get another couple of bags, back over again. I thought, why don't they just drive the tent and truck over? Those are potatoes that they've grown, are they? Um, they no, they pick them up, they pick them up on this side of the border, a wholesaler. Um, and uh, carry them over in 200, kilo, you know, 200 uh, weight bags at a time. Um, I thought, why not take a 10 ton truck over? But if they did that, there's no banking system. So there'd be nobody over there who's got enough money to buy the 10 tons of potatoes, um, and they'd probably get the lorry pinched. So, um, so they take them over a bag at a time, get the cash, come back over, and then just carry them back and forth a bag at a time. But that's a bit like hard work, isn't it? Um, the other thing is disabled people um, have a job here um, because uh, although vehicles aren't allowed to cross, um, disabled um, um, scooters, or uh, not, not scooters, um, actually push, uh, chairs, wheelchairs are allowed to cross. So you'll see there, that's a disabled wheelchair, believe it or not. Um, so what they've done is they've made it into almost a trailer, put a disabled person on top of it, and then put two or three able-bodied people pushing it <laughs> to um, get it across the border and carry that much more stuff. Um, again, it's, uh, I, I, it never ceases to amaze me to see these things. But, um, and then uh, there's the border itself, um, so you can see how um, you know, this, side is, you know, this side is Rwanda, the other side is, um, 
the DRC, um, where they had the, uh, the troubles there uh, last year. Um, okay, a couple of things, a couple of people here. Again, carrying stuff on the head. You can see how beautiful it is, the land of a thousand hills. Um, really, really beautiful area. That's tea uh, being grown uh, behind them. So, uh, and literally the tea goes right the way up the hill. They don't waste, you know, they don't waste a plot of land. Uh, the, the, all the uh, hills are um, terraced and there's uh, stuff being grown all the way through. Uh, back into town, um, that's uh, taken from our little coffee shop, not quite Costa, but, um, but it's somewhere that's uh, clean and um, we sit there and watch the world go by. And I think that fella there is carrying, is it one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, about ten mattresses on his head. <laughs> <laughs> about ten, I think it is. But, um, Again, they walk past crazy, you know, they, they have bottles and they have boxes of bottles on their heads almost as high as them. Um, but it's just busy all the time. Uh, right, come on. Here we go, so back to me, uh, back to um, our class. Um, so we had, uh, the first year, uh, we had one big classroom and, um, let's go back one, sorry. So... Here we are. One big classroom, um, but uh, we had a tent outside the classroom, so we were able to have a bit of a breakout room. And obviously, if we needed smaller groups, they'd go under the tree. Um, and um, you can see how they're so active. You know, these, these are senior cops, but, um, but they just can't get enough of it. You know, they, they, it. They really want to make a difference and they want to learn, uh, which is really uh, satisfying. Um, women in the group, uh, we had 28 students, two of them were women uh, the first time, uh, but um, hopefully uh, we'll, you know, we're, we're looking to get uh, more women um, coming along. Rwanda has one of the best um, equality uh, policies, they've got 50% women in parliament um, and they're aiming to get uh, more, uh, more women in the senior uh, decision making places. Um, there's two deputy inspector generals of police, one was a man, one was a woman, uh, but she's now moved on to the prison service, so uh, she's probably counting for their stats now. Uh, so we need to get um, somebody back into the Rwanda police service. Uh, this um, this uh, place that I teach, um, it's called the, uh, the National Police, National police uh, College, and the commandant there, a really enlightened man, uh, wants to get his college built as an East African um, centre of excellence uh, where people will come from Africa um, and be taught you know, at his college. But uh, you see that, that, that next picture that you saw just now, um, when I went there, um, they had a conference room. Again, everything seems to be built on the traditional way, university type ways, uh, with the tiered, tiered um, seats. Uh, was we were trying to get them away from that a little bit to help get them more involved. Um, this building here was there, that's our classrooms on the top. Um, and um, I, told, I told them exactly what I wanted, um, and that's what we were given. Um, so that was the room that uh, he managed to get for us. Um, and uh, obviously we then got it changed to that in about six weeks. So um, as far as building is concerned, uh, they certainly uh, got, it, uh, got it done um, very, very well and very, very quickly. And certainly the facilities we have are second to none. Um, another big room like that near it is split into three uh, breakout rooms, and you can see one of them there um, with um, a tame uh, journalist that we got in to do some interviewing. Um, it was certainly a stretching uh, targets that we had for them. Um, there you can see us um, trying to get them to stretch that little bit further. Um, and um, so they, they thought like they'd never thought before. Um, look at the, the life in them. You, know, you can see the, you, know, you see how active they are, um, they with their, uh, how animated they are with, with their learning, with their discussions. Um, really, really get stuck in. And this stuff again, same stuff you get in, uh, in Europe uh, with the flip charts and um, uh, you know, group work and um, just something that they just weren't used to but thoroughly enjoyed. Uh, all ports, don't know, probably a lot of you will have heard about that, um, 
It's um, the um, oh, after the war, uh, um, Gordon Allport looked at um, how Hitler um, took ordinary nice people into people who were um, killing um, the Jews, destroying them, uh, murder, genocide. Um, and he worked out that it has to start somewhere quite small. Uh, so it starts off with people bad-mouthing, going through to uh, avoiding them, picking on them, uh, minor assaults, and then physical assault right the way up until eventually it's acceptable to, um, to actually carry out a, gen uh, carry out a genocide. Um, you imagine when we were talking about this, um, they were very much thinking about themselves, thinking about how their own people um, could actually get to the stage where they just kill each other. Um, so um, it's, although you talk about Germany, uh, we were very much taking it um, into, their, um, in, in, into their own world. I uh, can't really see that very well, but um, I couldn't do it any other way. Um, this was the Ten Commandments of the, of the Hutus um, that was around uh, back in uh, 1990. Again, frightening to think how recent it was. Um, but, um, but if you look at that, uh, the first one, um, published in 1990, Hutus must know that the Tutsi wife, wherever she may be, is serving the Tutsi ethnic group. In consequence, any Hutu who does the following is a traitor, acquires a Tutsi wife, acquires a Tutsi mistress, acquires a Tutsi secretary or dependent. All Hutus must know that our Hutu daughters are more worthy and more conscientious in their role of women spouse and mother. Are they not more beautiful, good secretaries and more sincere? All the stuff that we've seen um, or read about um, in our history prior to the wars, this is the stuff that was happening in Rwanda uh, back in 1990. So uh, it made it really real for them um, and bearing in mind one of our main aims is to, to prevent um, further genocides uh, both in Rwanda and in the other uh, surrounding African countries uh, this was a really, really powerful lesson. Um, but then we did the powerful stuff, but we also um, had a bit of fun. So you can see them here, um, these big tough guys um, building beautiful buildings out of straws. Um, and um, just getting used to the idea of being, um, being led by different types of leaders. So uh, the point of this wasn't to build a beautiful building, it was to experience being led by a, a democratic leader, an autocratic leader, um, and a laissez-faire leader. Um, and then they talked through uh, what that experience was like afterwards. Uh, but it, to them, it was really important to build a beautiful building. Um, so you can imagine they were the three buildings that we, we got at the end, and we had to get somebody in to, to judge them. Um, the concentration on things like card building. Um, sounds quite strange. Uh, when people look at these not having seen the lesson, um, you think, what on earth are they up to? But everything that we did had, um, had leadership uh, lessons. And, um, and, it, and it worked. The uh, classroom again, um, back out in the tent. Um, it's the weather. The weather there is just um, it's just phenomenal. Um, so it's lovely and warm, a bit like it is here today. Um, and um, look at that for a ponsetta, ponsetta, beautiful. Um, so that's one of the ones in the garden um, of the college. Um, these things grow like trees over there. Um, but um, hey, got to put that one up. Um, then uh, the afternoons, uh, we had them for the morning. Um, and the university had them in the afternoon. Um, so the university, uh, they were doing a master's degree course um, for over a 12-month period um, in our afternoons. Um, and they um, spend the afternoon studying and, um, and really, um, you know, getting, you know, really um, getting into it. Um, the, uh, the lecture I used to feel quite sorry for. Um, because um, <laughs> we used to wear them out in the morning doing active things and then they'd sit in the classroom in the afternoon being lectured to. So, um, nightmare. But, um, then uh, it, wasn't all, it wasn't all work. Uh, we went to uh, the Akagera uh, National Park uh, on one of the weekends and um, they showed us um, the, the, sort of the African animals. Um, once you've seen one zebra, you've seen them all, but um, 
There's um, same with giraffes coming two by two, um, and um, and these things, um, the impala, impala. Those they can't half jump. Um, again, that photograph um, was purely by chance. It, 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 I took the photograph and then looked at it afterwards and saw the one impala jumping over the others. So, uh, but uh, it was a wonderful experience to be able to see it and uh, not being on holidays, actually being there whilst I was working. Uh, an elephant. I uh, don't see very many elephants over there, but uh, we weren't allowed to go very close. Uh, but uh, elephant in the bush and a couple of monkeys. These are the sort of things you expect to see, I think, when you go to Africa. But uh, so um, we try whenever we go over there just to see something, and um, that people pay thousands of pounds to uh, uh, to see when we uh, when they go there on holidays. A um, couple more monkeys. And then those of you who are um, into your beauty treatments, um, you'll see the effect uh, that a mud bath has um, <laughs> at a really beautiful animal. Um, and I think it must be the, uh, the mud pack that, um, that actually makes the difference. Uh, back, to, um, back into Kigali again, I would say everything is, um, you know, everything is uh, carried by foot and on their heads. Um, and you just see people all over the place with this stuff on their heads, you know, carrying fruit and vegetables uh, either for sale or to, uh, to take back home. And then this is the field next door to our, um, our hotel. Um, I think I said earlier on, pet, um, earnings are about a pound a day, uh, petrol is about a pound a litre. Um, so uh, cars are about the same prices as here. Um, I didn't find any shops selling new clothes uh, or new shoes. Um, the craftsmen and women on building sites can earn £1.50 a day. Um, security officer earns about £30 a month um, carrying a wooden stave, whilst those who carry a, a sawn-off shotgun, um, they get a few pence more. Um, it's about £40 a month for a teacher. Um, so, uh, and say, petrol is still a pound a litre, um, hence uh, there's not an awful lot of driving. Um, and the working day starts at six in the morning, finishes about six in the evening. Um, our, um, um, our reception staff at the hotel, uh, there were two of them, one works days, one works nights, and if either of them wants a day off, the other one works the two shifts. So, um, so if they want a day off, one will do 24 hours, and then the other one will do the 24 hours the next day. But, um, it's, and they're happy, they're smiling, you know, they've got jobs, they've got work, they've got uniform, they've got food. Um, and it seems, to, um, it seems to work for them. Um, these ladies here, oh, that, um, that was the creche that you saw, sorry, go back one. Um, that was the creche um, at, in the field. You can see the baby, the baby is down there under, the, um, under, that, under that cover um, that's uh, over the bush. Um, so the baby's down there whilst mum is... Um, is digging in the field. Um, these three ladies, um, it took them three days to uh, plough and uh, sort that field out uh, with 12 inch hoes. So, um, really good, you know, they're really hard working. Um, they're all day. Um, they'd have made themselves sort of um, three pounds each type of thing and uh, set the field. Who needs a tractor? When you've got people like that, they did so, so, such a much better job. And you can see the bonus they had um, with the potatoes that you see behind them. So uh, it was obviously potatoes last year's crops. So as they're clearing this one out, um, they find a load of potatoes that were left behind from the harvest last year. Um, and they'll have a bag of potatoes as, um, as a bonus, if you like, having um, uh, finished their um, clearing. Um, I don't know if any of you remember those toys. Uh, quite a few of the children uh, you see going around town with a wheel and a stick, um, sort of wheeling the stick, hoping one day to get a bicycle, I suppose. Um, but um, it's, that's one of the uh, one of the toys that they they actually use. Um, I said there's certainly a lack of money there, uh, but it seems to be plenty of vegetables. Um, they get two or three um, crops every year and um, it seems to be a good subsistence as far as um, food is concerned. Um, meat, still Tootsies um, have this idea about, uh, oh, they don't, they're not Tootsies anymore, but uh, people still like to have more than 10 cows. Um, and um, 
they, uh, as far as that's because uh, they, that's their wealth. You know, if you've got animals, then you can have milk um, or meat. Whereas if you haven't got the animals, all you can have is veg. Um, so anyway, um, I needed a strategic project um, to bring our studies to life. Um, so I found a lady called Peace uh, Roussage in a project called Aspire um, in Kigali. Uh, what she does is she takes 100 ladies, uh, 100 poor ladies from the area um, each year into her, it uh, used to be her home, now she's got somewhere slightly bigger. Um, brings the children as well and she teaches them um, skills, craft skills, how to make baskets, um, how to do hairdressing um, and, those, and cooking. Um, puts the children in a bit of a tent outside and teaches them primary school um, education prior to primary school, so it's pre-primary school education. Um, and she teaches them um, these various skills. At the end of the year, she sets them up as a cooperative um, and they then leave her, go and work as a cooperative uh, with sufficient skills and seed funding that they get um, from a, a local agency um, so that they can then um, continue with the, uh, using the skills that they've got and carry on um, living their lives um, hopefully prosperously or less, in less poverty than they were before. Um, I met her, uh, met her one of my first times out there because I wanted to take my cops along um, so that they could see how a project could begin with an idea, how the project plan gets put together, um, how she had to then get sponsors um, and put, um, you know, get a strategy into action. Uh, right the way through to evaluating it and keeping it going thereafter. So it's a real life project um, they came in to actually see. Um, she also keeps women off the streets uh, by doing this, um, so they're likely to be away from crime, so it does, it does the criminal um, justice system good, um, does the children good, um, so it's a win-win um, situation all round. Uh, when we visit, the police officers are surprised because they've never seen anything like this before. The children are surprised because they see police officers who normally they only see with guns across their chests. So you can imagine that um, when we actually get there, um, the children uh, love coming up to the uh, police officers and the police officers love going with the children. And here's it, a bit of a pun intended, but um, piggyback to Teddy. So we've got a couple of police officers there with the armed, um, um, the, with their, uh, their guns protecting us, I suppose, from something. Um, but um, you see how that little baby at the front has got um, the teddy on uh, her back, the same way as the mums um, carry their uh, babies around with them. Um, yeah? Are these literate? Literate? Yeah, ours are. Ours have all got uh, first degrees. Um, our police officers have first degrees and can all speak English. Um, but uh, the PCs, the police constables, I would say possibly not. Um, but. Um, I'm still not quite sure of the joined upness, if you like, between the, the bosses that we're teaching and the, uh, the officers on the ground. But um, that's sort of that next stage, I think. Uh, you can see the kids, uh, you see the, a lot of these are wearing, um, they're wearing sort of next clothes. You'll see next clothes and Marks and Spencer's stuff. Um, that's because um, the last three years we've been taking um, clothes over to this project. So uh, my my aim had been to take a ton in the three years that, um, uh, that we've been there, and I've actually achieved that now. So um, every time we go, um, my, all my stuff goes in a haversack, and I take charity shop stuff over in four suitcases, um, and we just you know, feed it into the children. So uh, you'll see them, they're all, you know, they're all wearing um, superb quality clothes that we just cast off um, from our children and grandchildren. Um, but, um, so, they, so they love that. Uh, but absolutely gorgeous kids, as they are all around the world. Um, <laughs> but we throw these, you know, we throw our clothes away or send them to the charity shop. And um, whereas here, um, they'll wear, you know, those clothes will be worn for years. Um, you know, they'll, they'll come off one child and they'll go on to the next one and on to the next one and on to the next one until, um, you know, eventually they just threadbare. Um, Without, taking, without the children's clothes, then they tend to wear their parents' clothes, but only after their parents have worn them out. So, you know, so they're wearing sort of old, you know, big old T-shirts with holes and everything in them. Um, but, uh, so when we take these things over, it's, uh, it really is well received.
and that's Pace. Um, um, again, she's a, you know, a lovely lady. She was a social worker in Uganda uh, who retired and uh, wanted to make a difference. So um, she came over here, uh, came over to Rwanda and set this thing up. But um, another interesting thing, that laptop that she has in front of her, um, what do we do with the laptop when the battery runs out? When the battery breaks down, you throw it away and buy a new laptop, quite often. Um, over there, a laptop with a battery that doesn't work is a standalone PC. Plug it into the computer, you know, plug it into the mains, and it's a computer. So, um, so that's something that sort of changed my mind, you know, changed my mindset a little bit about the stuff that we check away. Come on. I push this again. It'll move forward twice. Come on, let's do it. There we go. And that one, I think, I th that one, um, I think on this little one, sir, should, it says something about to watch where I'm going is to know where I've been. <laughs> <laughs> it's crazy, you just see, the, you see these little things on their, uh, on their jumpers. Um, and then this lot, um, what um, Peace tends to do every day, she feeds them, um, but they get a, a, a cup of porridge. It's um, slurry looking stuff, but it's um, obviously full of goodness and um, you know, it's, it's a good meal for them. Um, but unfortunately, she can only take in 100 a year, um, and some kids are outside, you know, so they're outside the gate, can't get in, um, just sort of look on, um, I suppose, hoping that maybe their parents will be in there next year. But um, very, very difficult. Um, she she has to choose the people to come into her project each year. And there's obviously thousands out there to choose from, so she has to have a, a strict um, criteria, if you like. Um, she uses age, um, distance from the centre, um, and the fact that they are um, in the poverty um, gap, um, and then chooses the hundred people that she thinks will um, get most effect out of the training that she gives them. So um, she chooses the ones that are going to going to succeed. Um, she also makes them uh, sign for what it's worth, uh, an agreement that they will pass on their learning to other people uh, when they leave, uh, they leave her care at the end of the year. Um, she realised shortly after starting this, about five years ago, that um, the mums at the end of a year, if she just abandoned them, they wouldn't be able to carry on with their work because they still have young children. So now she allows the children to come back for up to three years uh, whilst the mums can then um, put some, you know, carry on with some work um, in their uh, cooperative at the end of their one year. Um, and the stuff they do, childcare programme, so porridge for the children, uh, children playing lunch for the children, uh, drawing and um, just getting themselves ready for when they eventually get to primary school, which is free uh, in Rwanda. Um, that's one of my officers. Um, giving her, a, I think it was either a thank you or um, asking a piece of questions. Um, and it's great, uh, when I'm there with my, uh, my students, uh, they ask her all the questions about what was the strategy, what was, her, what was the aim, objective, what were the evaluation and all this sort of stuff, and she just answers them with the same language as they've been learning um, in the class. So um, it's, you know, it really, really does, us, it does good for us. Um, vocational skills, as I said before, they do hairdressing and cookery, um, and um, uh, also some HIV testing and prevention and first aid training. Um, see they're bringing in the chicken to, uh, to be cooked. Um, so it comes in in its um, sort of original form, um, ready to be prepared and, um, um, and put into a pie. Um, the children then, um, obviously, you see the, the swings, the basic stuff, footballs, um, they, so they, they love it. Um, our course now has been going um, for three years, um, the, so we've now got to a th third set of people, um, so that's 30 each time, so we've now got 90 senior leaders um, have been trained um, through this particular course. Um, so we're getting to be a significant number of people uh, who can talk the same language and hopefully uh, progress the country. Uh, the second picture has got uh, His Excellency Paul, K Paul Kagami, 
um, their president at the moment, so it's, it's sort of supported at the highest level. Um, Paul Kagami, again, you'll have heard um, maybe on the television programs and stuff, some people like him, some people hate him. Um, he was the leader of the army that, uh, that came in and took over uh, when the genocide was happening. Um, the uh, official history uh, is that they came in and took over from the Hutus who were um, massacring the uh, Tutsis. If you looked at a recent panorama program uh, where there are people who were on the other side, um, then their history story is a little different. Um, you know, they say there were a million Tutsis there that could have been killed. So uh, they're suggesting that a lot of Hutus were killed as well. Um, but hey, um, that's, that's history. Normally gets written by the victors, doesn't it? Um, so um, we leave behind um, a legacy um, in the police service. Uh, over 15 different African countries, uh, police officers at the highest level getting trained, uh, train the same things as we train uh, at Brant Hill, at the police college in the UK. Um, so uh, hopefully uh, that will make a difference. Uh, we also leave behind a legacy as far as um, as far as Aspire is concerned. Um, you know, having taken uh, those those clothes over. Um, supported them as much as we could during the last three years um, and also got them introduced into the police at the highest levels um, and uh, you know, hopefully that will uh, serve to uh, make a little bit of a difference as well. Uh, one of my colleagues, uh, we were walking down the road and uh, these two little children came up and just grabbed hold of his hand and we carried on walking probably for a quarter of a mile and these children were still with us. No parents anywhere around. <coughs> Here you'd get locked up for it. <laughs> um, but uh, we walked down, turned around, walked back up again and um, sort of left them where we'd, uh, where we'd found them. But um, the, the children, were, as white men, uh, we tend to be um, the only white men in the city, uh, you know, in the town virtually. Um, and I thought on one occasion when I went out to my first black country uh, that I would feel the same as a black person uh, walking in a white area, uh, quickly realised that that wasn't the case because I'm a white man. So a white man walking down the street, I feel confident, I feel comfortable in my skin, I feel happy, not threatened, um, and I can walk down through a street full of black people without any problem at all. Um, different, I understand, to uh, the other way around, uh, which makes you think a little bit. You know, minority in number, but majority in power. Um, and as such, um, our attitudes are uh, that much different. Um, really sobering, we went to the, uh, coming to an end, we um, went to the um, genocide memorial, um, and there are um, oh, hundreds of thousands of bodies um, of people uh, buried in this particular place. Um, and uh, we went there, um, walked through the uh, memorial centre, um, and at one stage there is well, there are a load of photographs around the room um, of people um, who were killed during the genocide and uh, all ages, sizes and um, you know, from all over the place there. Um, and as we were walking around I heard a couple of my students saying, that's my father, that's my mother, that's my brother, that's my sister. Um, so you can imagine the, the, um, uh, the depth of feeling that was going on in, in that place at that particular time was, um, was quite uh, dramatic. Um, at the end of it, I got a, an Anglican pastor uh, to speak to us, um, an Anglican pastor who was very high up in, uh, within the politics um, of the country, uh, so not political, but uh, very well thought of. And uh, he came along and told us the story of how he, as a Tutsi, uh, lived in Rwanda prior to the genocide. His father was killed um, when he was younger, um, he lived through the genocide, came out of it the other side, and um, had to come to terms with his religion as a pastor, um, and had to come to terms with loving his enemies. Um, so not just forgiving, but uh, as far as he's concerned, um, he needed to love them. Um, so uh, again, one massive um, lesson for people to be uh, thinking about. Um, and at the end of it, obviously, we um, debrief, um, and debrief this for a morning, uh, with a view to ending up with you are senior police officers in your uh, respective African countries, what will you do, what can you do um, to prevent such a thing um, happening again? 
So um, that's uh, you know that's where uh, that's the whole point of that, that particular visit. You know, where it's not just a day out. Um, so when you go to Rwanda, if you do go to Rwanda, then uh, that's one of the places that um, you need to go just to uh, to see it and to experience that um, that sort of depth of feeling. And then the other thing, obviously, is go and see the gorillas. Uh, twelve families of gorillas. They have twelve visitors each day for one hour exactly. Um, it's about four hundred US dollars. Um, so four hundred US dollars to visit them for an hour. Um, say twelve families, twelve people, one hundred forty-four times four hundred dollars. Quite a lot of money. Um, but uh, that is the you know, that's the big money that they actually get um, for Rwanda. Uh, there are 16 families there all together. The other four families are kept away from people um, so that they um, don't get um, affected by people and they use them for uh, research purposes to make sure that they're all looked after properly. Um, so uh, when you visit Rwanda, that's the other thing. And then the other one is if you go to Rwanda, Africa or anywhere else, um, think about those children and those children's homes. They are everywhere. Um, if you have a look at um, the uh, rucksack.com on the, tele on the um, internet, uh, you'll see that whatever country you go to, there will be people who will be uh, on, that, uh, on that website saying they'll be grateful for any uh, clothes that you might be able to take. So I know sometimes it's difficult to find a bit of room in a suitcase, but uh, if you're going somewhere for a short period of time and you have room in the suitcase, then stuff your rucksack and um, drop it off uh, with one of those people um, and um, say, I'm sure it would be very, very, very well um, received. Um, as far as Rwanda is concerned, very, very peaceful. Um, I feel very safe when I'm walking around. Um, however, once a year or so, a hand grenade gets lobbed in. Um, they, some of your hand grenades will get dropped in at a, a market or a bus station or something like that. And just, I think, to remind people um, that there is still that underlying um, bit of um, issue um, in relation to the have-nots and the haves. Um, no Tutsis and Hutus now, people are now Rwandan. Um, but just because they're Rwandan, it doesn't mean you still haven't got the haves and the have-nots. So uh, we'll have to wait and see, see, how, uh, see how it gets on. Any questions? You see you walking around. Yeah. Females. yeah, females, no problem, anybody. Um, yeah, really, um, I, I do feel absolutely safe, and females as well. I, I'm sure they would. Um, it, it's and pitch dark. There just doesn't seem to be any. There doesn't seem to be any crime there, um, and I think there's no crime because there's nothing to pinch. You know, there's people, you know, there's, there's nothing there to steal. Um, they do get the odd uh, murder in a family uh, for land grabbing. You know, so sort of um, to kill the, you know, kill the kill their father to be able to get his land off it, but, um, uh, but generally there's not, much, uh, there's not much crime. If there's not much crime, what do the police do all day then? Uh, good idea, <laughs> same as they do here, not a lot. <laughs> um, I think that shows how successful they are. But, um, outside, so outside, outside every bank, uh, there's a security officer with a sawn-off shotgun, uh, not sawn-off, with a pump-action shotgun. And I said, well, what on earth is that pump action shotgun there for? How often have they had to fire them? Never. Well, why are they there then? To make sure that, that they, never they never have to use them. <laughs> and that seems to be the idea. You know, the police, the police carry guns, um, but they don't use them, thankfully, because if there was an armed robbery or something, I wouldn't want to be around when they're setting up, you know, when they're firing that shotgun. You know, that's an awful machine, awful weapon. Sorry, yeah. If anyone is interested, through RW, through, through WWF, it's possible to adopt one of the, the uh, baby gorillas. I have for several years, yeah. and um, every so often I get an update of how my adopted baby gorilla is doing. <laughs> but that's one way of supporting Great. how they're prospering, which they are. So WWF, <coughs> yes. you can adopt a gorilla in Rwanda? Yes, World Wildlife Fund. Great, there we are. Thank you very much. <coughs> yeah. Well, I'll, I'll come to you, Dorothy. Yeah. The sponsors want your, uh, your outfit, your... Okay. And to the, the college should be sold and things like that. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the, the, the country itself is 
thriving. It doesn't have many minerals, um, so they say, um, but they get an awful lot of aid from all around the world. Um, so our bill uh, for the college over here, we're told gets paid by Rwandan government. But I suspect that the British government um, feed a load of aid back into Rwanda. Um, so I suspect that it sort of comes around in a circle. Um, that the aid gets to there and then they've got the money to pay us, we do the work and the, we bring the money back again. Um, the college itself, uh, they'll go to wherever they can to get money to uh, sponsor it. Um, this one, what he's hoping to do is sell the training that we're currently doing to the other African countries so that the students who come in will then pay for the, uh, for the courses that have been run by them. That's the idea. Dorothy. Yeah, Dorothy. Uh, Dorothy, I'll come back to you, John. Yeah. Um, one of the slides that you back. Yeah. Um, somebody was holding like a big platter or something. What were those little things that were on it? Um, I think they were probably there. flowers. Those? Flowers. Flowers? Yeah, it's a wreath. Oh, I so see. they're laying a wreath that the. They um, look like little chicks. All oh, oh, right. <laughs> okay. <laughs> No, it was a wreath. Thanks. Okay. Thank you. John. Thank you. What, what is the um, comparative size of Rwanda? Is it about the size of Great Britain and smaller or much bigger Rwanda? And secondly, seeing all the children, there's lovely pictures, a remarkable transition from um, genocide. Is family life very stable over there? Are the children born within wedlock? Is, is, is the family relationship of the, the child to the mother to the grandmother, is that stable? Is that very important in Rwanda? Okay, um, don't know is the real answer. Um, the size of it, I was hoping somebody wasn't going to ask me that. It's pretty big, don't know. Um, and um, the, as far as the relationships concerned, the church certainly is very strong there. Um, you've got the Seventh-day Adventists. They have, oh, it must be thousands of people go to church in the, in the Seventh-day Adventist place um, that in, in the town that I'm in. And then there are two massive high churches as well that are always really, really full. Um, so the Christian, you know, the Christian um, um, teachings are certainly very, very well um, um, taken up. Um, so I assume that, that would be um, carried out then with weddings and things like that. Certainly, this place in Aspire, um, the the people who are uh, are there tend not to be married, but they have a couple of ceremonies each year where they get involved with the family as well as the women. Um, and um, they have a couple of weddings each year uh, where they sort of bring the, the man together as well um, to try and create a, a proper family, I say proper, a, um, a traditional mother-father um, uh, married family. Yes? Just a quick question. Go on, next slide. What is the significant, uh, significance of the objects you brought with you? Oh, right. oh yes, the objects, thank you. Um, the, uh, Pat says to me every time I go to Africa, don't bring back any more wood. Um, because I can't resist it. Um, I bring back animals and um, um, sticks and all these things. You know, carved, um, you know, carved gorilla sticks and all this sort of stuff. Um, so I bring these back and she just keeps giving me a hard time. Because um, what on earth do you do with something like that? It looks good when you're in Africa, like a donkey does in, um, in Spain. But... Um, but when you bring it home, it doesn't do much. Um, but the other things I've brought, um, again, I can't resist them. On the back table um, are, um, they call them peace, um, peace bowls. Um, and I think they're made out of, um, out of banana skin or something like that. And, but it takes the women, this is some of the stuff that peace uh, teaches them. It takes the women about a week um, to make one of these bowls. Um, and have a look at them afterwards. They're, uh, I think they're amazing. But um, and then they sell them. They sell them in the place that I'm at for a five, five pounds each for the big ones and four pounds for the little ones. And then in the hotels, they're selling them at sort of twenty quid and fifteen quid each. Um, but um, um, so they sort of take take best part of a week to build to to make, um, and they get a five for it at the end. So again, back to this pound a day. Um, but at least they can make it out of materials that they find for nothing um, and colour them. But um, I keep bringing them back as well. Pat said, what are we going to do with them? <laughs> so, <laughs> thanks. All right. Well, I'm conscious of the fact that we have the AGM following yeah. the talk. And um, we've had you questions. Who did I invite you to ask questions during his talk? But we've had sufficient questions, very interesting questions. 
And I'd like to call on Margaret Williams now to offer a vote of thanks on our behalf. Margaret, please. Okay. Um, I think I can manage without can that. Can you all hear me at the back? Yes. 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 It's, it's my pleasure to uh, propose a vote of thanks. And while, while he was talking, there was some years ago where we heard about Rwanda every news, bad things, but it's gone out of mind, doesn't it? Yes. You forget all about it until you have a talk like this. And isn't it nice to see how people appear to have recovered from all that, you know? Okay. There was all that mayhem, the genocide, it was dreadful. Okay. Thank you for a most... They're pretty little girl. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for a most informative talk, and we hope perhaps we'll hear from you again. Thank you. Thank you.